Hello, and welcome to a very special escape pod. No, we're not going to be discussing the drug problems of our dear daughter Blossom, but instead we bring you the recording from Worldcon. We had a live escape pod episode with a whole bunch of people from the show, and then we had a live reading of a story. The story will show up in our regular feed, so if there's a little bit of a hiccup in the show, that's why. Also, we recorded this with handheld recording devices, so the quality will not be what you're used to. Still, we had a lot of fun, and we hope you enjoy listening to it. (laughs) Premiering live. Hello, and welcome to a very special episode of Escape Pod. I always wanted to say that. (laughs) Here's what what we have for you over the next hour and a bit. We're going to introduce you to the show, who we are, how we do what we do, how we got here. We'll discuss the show a little bit, then we'll have a reading from the incredible Laura Perlman of her story, Some Things I Should Probably Have Mentioned Earlier, followed by some commentary from my hosting colleague and active duty superhuman, Setsu who hosts one of our sibling shows, Podcastle. And then, we have treats. <laughs> so, Escape Pod, a potted history. First came the dinosaurs, then they died and turned into oil. Skipping ahead a little bit, roughly 15 years ago, Sarah Ely had an idea. This was when podcasting was an exciting, old-timey digital mining town where everyone moved a little too quickly and GeoCities was still a thing. <laughs> that plan was this. Buy the reprint rights for a new science, for a science fiction story, read it into a microphone, and release it into the wild as something new, called a podcast. At that point, podcasting was still a term that was, how can I put it, format agnostic. Now, in the jetpacks and food pills, Kickstarter and GoFundMe future of 2018, that seems weird. But, much like the stories on our horror show Pseudopod, I promise you it's true. <laughs> Anyway, something very odd happened. The show instantly found an audience. Sarah's readings, editorial skill, and the simple fact that these stories all fit neatly into a commute meant that suddenly people got to listen to something other than their music when they went to work, or did housework, or went for a run, or did anything. A skateboard became not just a near-overnight success, but one of the most on-brand publications in the field. This was, and still is... A literal escape. Time passed. The audience and the responsibilities grew, and Sarah ultimately stepped away. By this stage, the company was three shows wide. Escape Pod for science fiction, Pseudopod for horror, and which is, of course, my own Squamous Rugos home, and Podcastle for fantasy. One episode a week, one story a week. Three flavors. Later, with the addition of Cast of Wonders, our YA show, that would grow to four. Well, the company's flight path was, at times, and as you will hear at Escape Artists Live later today, a little rocky, Escape Pod has always been relatively smooth sailing. Editors like Jeremiah Talbot and Norm Sherman served, served tours on the show and left their mark. The crew expanded and the pod just kept on escaping. In the intervening time, I'd graduated from Pseudopod host to co-owner of the company, did some turns out in deep space myself, and it was, and is, always fun. Just like the show's original, iconic sign-off line, reminded people to have. And that brings us to the current iteration of of Escape Pod and to the command crew you see before you today. Norm stepped away in 2017 and left a legacy defined by his gloriously skewed eye for character and detail and a wry sense of humor that he has brought back to his newly revived and equally eccentric home, the Drabblecast. He was succeeded by S.B. Divya and Mer Lafferty. Divya, whose novella Runtime is for sale now and is one of the shining stars of Tor's novella lineup, has an engineer's eye for detail and precision combined with an incredibly balanced, discerning approach. Mer, who is a triple Hugo nominee this year, pause for it. I am so proud of you people. I actually had pause for applause written in here. <laughs> has been a friend of the show and the company since the start. She's edited both Escape Pod and Pseudopod before, edited our much-missed magazine, Mothership Zeta, and continues to set legions of writers on a good course through her work on I Should Be Writing and Ditch Diggers. And she totally wrote a Star Wars novel that's coming out soon as well. <laughs> totally. <laughs> totally. <laughs> ben Kinney is an active neuroscientist, and he claims... 
inactive cyborg primate manufacturer. Ben spent <laughs> his work as a. I made myself laugh. Uh, <laughs> his work has appeared in Strange Horizons, Podcastle, and many others. He's got a scientist's eye and an artist's signature, and as assistant editor, is the final part of the command circuit of this newest and first ever Hugo nominated iteration of Escape Pod. But they aren't alone. The incredible Tina Connolly, whose fiction is essential reading and whose own Toasted Cake podcast. Stand is up, Tina! Stand, Stand up, up, Tina! Woo! Is essential listening, hosts the show, along with Mur, Divya, and myself. And then there's audio producers Adam and Summer, associate editors and slush wranglers Laura Pillman, SK Nash, Aaron Roberts, J.R. Dawson, Santiago Belucho. Darcy Little Badger, Sandy Parsons, Darusha Weem, Peter Baravish, Remy Nakamura, and Ryan Boyd. The ed- this is an incredible and global team. This, this editorial team regularly turn out great science fiction. They do so for free. For you. Like now. <laughs> Escape Pod has been around almost 15 years. It, combined with the other EA shows, has a back catalogue of 2,000 episodes and counting, and is just getting started. So, before it becomes story time, let's have a chat with them. Editorial team, how yes. are you? We're good. Good. Yes. Good, good. It's morning at Worldcon. Yes. Saturday. I'm going to swap <laughs> seats with Norm so I can talk to all of you at once. What's up? What's up? See, this is the kind of red-hot content that you people tune in <laughs> week out. That's why we read you stories. <laughs> <laughs> so... What's the process? Why do you like it? Why do you do what you do? Tell me everything. 15 minutes or less, go. <laughs> Mer, we, get, we get to read stories. People send us stories. It's free. It's, it's, it's like free anthologies. You suckers. <laughs> we get all these anthologies sent to us all the time. It's great. Remember, vote early, vote often. Yes. I, I, it's, it's just seeing what people are making out there. It's, it's just awesome. I love reading stories. I love, uh, and I love producing them comes in, it goes out. It's great. Someone else talk. I'm getting embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's science fiction, and I've always loved science fiction, and uh, finding a gem of a story in the submissions pile, a new thing that you love, and then now have a platform to share it with everybody out there, it's a pretty amazing feeling, and uh, I've really been enjoying it. I'm very new to this, unlike these fine people over here. I'm very happy to be part of this crew. Aww. Aww. We love you, Divya. Yeah. The only thing I can add to that great statement is how wonderful it is to work in this team and this family of not only the people on the stage, but all the, the, the readers who named earlier and everyone else across the Escape Artist family. Like Knowing that, that we are here together finding these these amazing stories and getting them out to, to people and in all this together is a real part of the joy of that process. And can I I'm sorry, go on no. Oh I didn't I wasn't going on. Go ahead. <laughs> I, the only thing I would add is that I'm always amazed and awed and honored that uh, we have a platform. People thought that the Gutenberg Press was a big deal, and it was at the time, but the fact that we have so much reach now, and we can build a global community of, of folks. I mean, I just met all these guys, aside from Murr in person for the first time across the world, you know? And it's, it's a neat thing how science fiction stories brings people together that have never met. We're looking forward to meeting everybody out there, too, afterwards. Um, one thing that I love about this is uh, what Sarah created before there was a Hugo packet, uh, Sarah decided that you, the average Hugo voter who may not subscribe to Asimov's is not going to be able to, like in spring of 2018, is not going to go out and find the April issue of Asimov's from 2017 to read the Hugo-nominated story. And so Sarah decided to go out and buy the reprint rights for every Hugo nominee that she could. And so we were like the first... Hugo Packet for short story before the Hugo Packet existed. And now that the Hugo Packet exists, we don't need to do that anymore. But I actually miss it a little bit because it was exciting to listen to the nominees and then think, okay, now we get to approach uh, Ken Liu and just every, uh, uh, Mike Resnick and just say, you know, you, you did amazing things and now we want to bring it to audio. 
And so there was that and just the fact that not a lot of people were focusing on fun. Science fiction can and often is and usually is dark and gritty and unhappy and you know, Sarah wanted to make something fun and I really am, am proud to be a part of that legacy. I kind of think we need that more than ever right yeah. now. Yeah. We need hope, we need light, you know, and, uh, and we're happy to be able to bring that to all of you. Somebody asked me at my coffee class yesterday what's different about um, editing a skate pod versus a traditional short fiction magazine. And I said one of the coolest things that we get to do is add this audio dimension. You know, we handpick our narrator, we try to make them fit with the story, and that's a privilege because that person is reflecting the story back to the author and needs to do credit to it and can sometimes teach the author new things, speaking as someone who's had her stories read back to her. Um, and it's pretty amazing that we are up here amongst the venerable company of print magazines. It really is. I mean, this is something... Uh, I'm, I'm always very conscious at times like this that, that my job is, is to basically be slightly invisible um, because I work with these incredible people who do amazing work and my job is often just to make sure that you're hydrated, <laughs> you're getting enough sleep. Um, but it, it is an absolute privilege and it's something which my most recent duties with Escape Pod have, re have really helped snap into focus for me. Uh, I'm currently hosting Flashback Fridays, which is a monthly feature we do where I basically dive into the Warehouse 13-esque archives of the show, pull, another, pull an episode out from them and talk about it with 2018's perspective rather than 2006 or, to, or whatever. And it's fascinating to hear the changes. Uh, and it's fascinating to come to a story with different eyes after that period of time. And it's really something that genre fiction excels at, where, you know, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm classically educated. Those of you who've seen Avenue Q, uh, the answer to the opening refrain of what do you do with a BA in English is you become me. <laughs> and um, I, I always try and bring that critical analysis to it. And it's, it's fascinating to see that shift, and you get that with genre fiction, it's a mirror, and it's a mirror that changes every time you look at it, and every way that you look at it, and I think Escape Pod is an incredible example of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get too deep, Al, we can't follow you. <laughs> and further to that, <laughs> um, I, would, I wanted to talk to you about, uh, about your, your submissions process and about how that's evolved over time because, I mean, inclusivity is something which, and, and diversity is something which the field as a whole is very engaged with and becoming more engaged with all the time. And I was wondering how that is changing how the pod is steered, if you will. You want to start with Slush? Yeah. Um, part of it involves uh, the team of associate editors, of, of, of readers that we get, and making sure that we have, uh, that we can do our best to have a wide variety of perspectives and be able to understand stories that don't fit into you know, the, the classical science fiction mindset. Um, that we can really see the, the full breadth of amazing stories that are out there in the universe and make part of um, and bring to you all uh, that have been so long overlooked. And you know, this is always a an ongoing, perpetual process of our whole field is working toward trying to figure out. Um, the other thing we do at the at the slush level is simply by um, anonymizing missions for the first read and not the second read so that we have chances for stories to shine on their own but also a chance for us to look at who the who the author is and and rethink how that um, how that perspective informs our view of the story you can both kind of get both sides of the way of looking at a story can I totally jump in and just quickly say that Please we do. have our guest editors for Artemis Rising who are going to reprise their awesome job that they did this year for next year. And I just want to quickly point them out to you because submissions are opening September 1st and they will be looking for your work. And that is Laura Perlman and Tina Schneider. And that is one of our efforts um, in doing that kind of outreach and adding to diversity and 
correcting some of these historical imbalances in the world of science fiction. Um, another thing we're trying to do is uh, understand that there have been a lot of marginalized voices just look at constant rejections with words that uh, we, we all know are now becoming, what's the word, dog whistles of, you know, oh, couldn't relate to your character. Well, we know what that means. And just, so we know that a lot of people just are not going to reach out to a place that they think is going, they self-reject. And so we know that it's our job to reach out to marginalized voices to say, we want your stuff, please, please submit to us. So we've been changing our submission guidelines and try to be vocal in, uh, among short fiction writers just to say, we, we want to hear it all. Excellent. Um, is there anything else you would like to discuss before we get to Laura's fantastic story? Can I recognize one more member? Please do. Office? Always please do. There, There's a Rachel Jones sitting back there quietly oh. who's responsible for a lot of this. Yeah, Rachel, please stand up. Rachel, she's here at the last minute. In fact, we have a lot of EA folks from kind of across all four shows in the audience. How about we have them all stand up? There's <laughs> Alex Hoffelick, co-editor of Pseudopod of the Bible. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I forgot to mention. Oh, yeah. Oh, Do we have narrators in the audience? Yeah. Please. One of our shining stars. If you have ever worked for us in any capacity, please stand up. Yeah. 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 We, we are a very so large, large group that, and we, you know, the people who've worked for us in any capacity is probably part of what makes makes us succeed because if yeah. we only had you know once upon a time it was one person taking on an awful lot of work and um, the, the growth has been amazing one thing I forgot to mention that still gobsmacks me is one thing Escape Pod has done that almost no one believes is let a lot of podcast listeners know that there are print magazines that buy science fiction we had a lot of fans who were just like, oh, I found this science fiction story, and you told me there's a magazine called Asimov's out there. I had no idea. <laughs> we got that a lot. I couldn't believe it. It's like they were, but they were coming in from a different area of loving science fiction, and they got the audio, and then it just opened them up to, I had no idea this short fiction thing was so, you know, historical and varied and, and out there. So I, I just felt immense pride when I found out that we were teaching people that these magazines that have existed for decades still are around. And I think, that's, I think that's one of the real big strengths of the format and the fact that people interact with audio in different ways maybe that they interact with anthologies or fiction. Spotify is one of the biggest growing podcast markets out there. It's people listening in their web browsers at work. And they come across podcasts and short fiction through entirely different ways than maybe those of us who grew up in the science fiction community came in through magazines or anthologies. And that brings an incredible inclusivity to the work that we do, and it just makes the entire pool of science fiction lovers larger, which is amazing. Exactly. Exactly. Hello, everyone. Usually when my voice appears on the podcast... It is to talk about listener feedback, but this time I'm here to talk about the other part of my job. Being assistant editor here at Escape Pod is like a metaphorical iceberg. Most of you only see the tip in the feedback sections that I, uh, that I, that I read, but the real mass lies below in all the stories we receive from our creative and tenacious authors. In our 10-month submission window from September 17th through June 28th, 2018, we received 1,974 stories. Comes out to about 5.66 per day, um, about. Uh, and <laughs> with those numbers, and in fact, all the numbers I'm saying today are just our regular submissions. It's not counting Artemis Rising, not counting our flash fiction contest. So, quick look at those 2,000 stories from our main submissions. We had about 315 reprints. I notice I keep saying about and yet having precise numbers. You will just have to tolerate this. Um, about. Um, <clears throat> Science. 
315 reprints, the rest were original stories, never before published, and for 1,641 stories, the author told us where in the world they came from, and their answers spread all over the world. 60% from the US, 8% from Canada, 6% from the UK, and 2% from the Australia, leaving 139 stories from elsewhere, including Brazil, Ghana, Greece, Malaysia, Malta, Singapore, and 30 other countries. Now, somehow we had to winnow those 2,000 stories down to just one per week. And we have fewer than 52 slots. We have things like Flashback Fridays and Artemis Rising and multi-week novelettes, all of which take up time without drawing from the main submission queue. And you all out there give us some incredibly hard choices, compounded by these limits of time and budget and gravity. So, 1,974 stories. Everyone got read by someone on our associate edit editor team, and they passed about a third of them, 665 stories, came up to me. And of those, I held on to 28% of them, 188 stories for a second read. And every one of those was a story that I would have loved hearing on a skate pod. But I could only send so many of them up to Murr and Divya. I passed a little under two-thirds of that pile, 119 stories, up to the co-editors for their final round. And of those 119, we've accepted 29 so far. There may be a couple more yet before we're done. We still have 30-ish uh, left in our pile to consider. So I can't say exactly what fraction of that pile gets accepted, but it's at least a quarter, maybe a little more. And overall, that means out of the 1,974 stories, our acceptance rate was about 1.5%. And uh, hopefully next year, that'll include more stories from all of you. And uh, all of that required countless hours of hard work by our amazing team of associate editors. Every story you hear on Escape Pod happens because these brilliant and generous folks put in the time to keep us flying. So Alistair listed uh, the names earlier, but I'm going to do it again because I want to finish with a shout out to everyone who was on that team during the 2017-2018 season. Uh, Peter Baravesh, Santiago Baluco, Ryan Boyd, J.R. Dawson, Sarah Gailey, Darcy Little Badger, Remy Nakamura, S.K. Nash, Sandy Parsons, Laura Perlman, Aaron Roberts, and Darusha William. If you see one of them, possibly here in this audience now, <laughs> thank them for making this possible. And uh, that's the state of the submissions from the past year. Thank you all for being part of the ride. Crunching the numbers. <laughs> you may not have noticed that, but they're halfway through Ben talking because he made a note saying, Ben, late night talk show. <laughs> okay, um, <laughs> uh, we are going to throw the floor open to questions with a shocking last minute twist, which became apparent when we hit the stage, which is we, for good questions, have prizes. So, <laughs> does anybody have any questions? The other, thing, <laughs> the other thing I would add is because we're recording, if you are capable of coming up to speak into a mic to ask your question, that would be great. If not, if you want to just raise your hand, what I'll do is I'll repeat your question into the mic so that we can capture it for the recording, if that's okay. <laughs> um, I project well, so I don't think I need to step up there. Um, I wanted to thank all of you. Um, I live in the middle of the woods, in a cabin, surrounded by crickets. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> and I burned a lot of wood. And my only contact with the outside world is through a satellite dish that's on top of my roof, uh, Houston Internet link. We have an extremely bad internet service, and because you allow the stories to be downloaded, people like us can survive through wonderful content. And I just wanted to thank you for allowing your content to be downloaded free of any uh, you know, digital rights management restrictions. So thank you for allowing us. Oh, it is absolutely our pleasure. Thank, thank you for listening. I want to come around to the side, and I'll get your sizing for. These are the very last run of vintage, original <laughs> <laughs> we, are, we are very proud of our Creative Commons license. We've been supporting Creative Commons since, uh, well, since Sarah started podcasting. So, um, you know, that thing we say at the very end, 
if, even if you tune it out, we say it every time, the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives License, <laughs> that is exactly what lo- allows us legally to do exactly what he said, to let you yep. guys download it and share it and enjoy it and keep it. And it's all legal and all awesome. So if you're ever curious about Creative Commons, you could look at creativecommons.org because it allows a lot of stuff to be distributed on the Internet and not break any copyright laws. And just as a quick aside to that, because my brain is horribly broken in a couple of ways, I have now said uh, this, the show is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license so many times. I actually always hear terrible 1980s Cockney pop music duo Chaz and Dave. The moment I've said that, I go, da 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 hey! <laughs> Can't help it every time. Anybody else? Mike? Sure thing. So the question was, what do we think the challenge is of such a spread out team? It's really hard to form Voltron. (laughs) (laughs) Waiting for Divya to wake up on the West Coast to read her email to find out we got a Hugo nomination. That sucks. Are you awake yet? Yeah. I'm at the office. I just got there. I sat down warming up my computer, and I get this text from her, and all it says is, in all caps, OMG, 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 and I'm like, what happened, what's wrong, who burned down, is there a hurricane, and I was like, hi Mer, what's going on, and she's like, check your email, and I'm like, oh god, now what, and, uh, and there it is, the Hugo nomination, I had to excuse myself from the office so that I could go squee properly outside. <laughs> Just my, my own version of that was, uh, of course, being, being a Brit, I am made entirely of rain. And, um, uh, the, and also because I work in kind of three or four different industries where I am prolific and it sometimes feels invisible, self-confidence is an occasional visitor in my head. So as is always the case, Hugo season kind of sucks the first time around because you go, is, is this going to be the year that you know my, my spirited defense of that movie that only I saw and liked? And I've written that article about six times of uh, six different movies is, is going to be the one that will break through and I'll get the best fan writer nomination and I didn't and of course I was like, I'm sad I'm going to go eat some cookies Aww. and this, this happened to fall on the same day that Mer and I have our weekly check in so we had the conversation and, and you know we planned stuff and then two hours later I checked my phone and again I have the block capitals message that says <laughs> get back online now <laughs> We have a question here. Hello. Hello. Where do oh. I need to be? That would be fabulous. Thank you. So, um, as an author, I have a two-part question. What story, plot, device, idea has been sent to you so many times and you didn't even want to read it the first time? <laughs> most writers would just stop. And then, on the other hand, what is it that you've gone, why has nobody done a story about this? I'll answer the first part, at least. Um, He has to read a lot more than we do. (laughs) So as mentioned in my day job, I'm a neuroscientist, and there's a very high bar for brain storage in all brain. This is one of my bugaboos that I go around telling people the brain is not a computer. You cannot put a brain onto a computer any more than you can upload a cheetah into a race car just because they both go fast. (laughs) So the story involves brain uploading, and sometimes like, this is a great story, but like you have said it in the wrong package. But if you do want to send us a story about a cheetah being uploaded into a race car, that might be cool. I'm pretty sure that one has never been done yes. before. Yes. Yeah. But I could be wrong because it's a large world and there's a lot of writers. That's right. Knowing, but as for stuff we're looking for, the only thing that comes to mind for me uh, is I was just talking the other day about how I I love stories with tons of MacGuffins. Like, like the Lost Room. I've been thinking about the Lost Room. It was a, a, a mini series a little while ago where there was a, a, a room with something bad happened in the room, but it it, it it remained magically exactly as it was. And then every single item in the room had a magical prop- property, and then they all were spread out everywhere. And so that and the Lost Swords. And I realized it's just it's just a cheap trick, and I. Love it. <laughs> I, love it. I love it so much. So I, I guess I don't see enough stories about a whole bunch of little MacGuffins that just need to be found. 
You want to say something smarter? Because that was <laughs> that's pretty. Good. I, you know, it's it's hard because yeah. I'm kind of both sides of here. I'm still pretty new as a writer of short fiction, and I get to decide what other short fiction gets published. And I've come to realize that yeah, it's it sounds cliche, but it's kind of true that even if you hit all our bugaboos, if you did something just that amazing, we're still going to publish your story. There's not a thing that's just like, rang, you know, they said upload, out it goes. Or in my case, that bugaboo is AI, because that's, that's my technical background. So when you start digging into the details, I'm going to start going, mm, I don't know, you're hitting my suspension of disbelief buttons pretty hard here. But that said, there's things I've read that are so charming and I'm like, that would never happen, but I don't care, because it's science fiction or magic, and ultimately it's about the story. Yeah, we have one, and I will give absolutely no details except for this one thing, where we both love the story, but Divi's like, something on page 14, that's not science, that's magic. And I'm like, I read page 14, I'm like, well, yeah, but the story's still awesome. <laughs> the one thing that absolutely cannot happen, I... See, I'm not the scientist, so like the stuff with character and how plot fits together, those are the things that, that tweak my no buttons, but um, I, I lean on these guys for, yeah, the science is really weak here, so, but... Um, but at the end of the discussion, I was still kind of like, but I still love this story, yeah. I really don't like it. <laughs> oh, yeah, it wasn't a deal breaker, but I just thought it was funny that I love this story, but that one thing that happened right there... Oh, yeah. Can't. Nope. Yeah, that, even from my phrase, try to phrase it as it sets a very high bar. Not that it's completely impossible. Yes. There was a recent story after Midnight of the Zap Stop that, yes. that I loved. Like this is like a three-word throwaway line that is the neuroscience all wrong. And like you know what? I'm just gonna post something online afterward about how the neuroscience actually works. <laughs> <laughs> the story is so good. I don't need to mess with the story for this. And it's really like an offhand comment. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Um, so has there been in the last year or in recent memory a story that hit the slush and just rocketed its way up to the top because everybody loved it? Yeah. Probably been a few. Yeah. Oh. I've seen your comments on that one. Yeah. Um. I mean, are you asking in the abstract? I don't know if he's asking for specific examples, but the, the short answer is yes, that happens. Yeah. Um, where, you know, the submissions reader loves it, then Ben loves it, and then we love it, and it's pretty much a, a yeah, we're going to buy this. You know? the, the rocketing is not, like, it doesn't actually move fast. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. And uh, Divi and I almost never disagree. There was one story which, before I read it, she threatened me. It was a little frightening. It was like early on in our relationship, and she's like, I will fight you if you don't want to accept this story. And I'm just like, I read like the first page. I'm like, okay, it looks good to me. I'm just like, please don't hurt me. But that's like the only time, and I was still on board with it. But we, it's, it's nice that we don't really disagree, even though uh, she's a lot more sciencey than I am, but we still gravitate toward the same good story. Um, I just first I want to say I really love you guys and I've been listening to Skip Hut for ten years. Do you mind coming a little bit closer yeah, sorry, just so we sorry. can capture? Your and um, I go ahead and repeat the compliment by all means. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just want to say I love all you guys and I've been listening to Skip Hut for ten years and uh, um, it's just it's just been great for like road trips and, and since I've had a couple of kids it's a little bit harder to listen to Skip Hut just. Because yeah. the kids are screaming or whatever, you know. Oh, I thought you were going to talk about the language. <laughs> uh, oh. Yeah, given my language, that's probably not. Uh, <laughs> okay. um, no. That's true. Um, but uh, no, um, I, I've also been working towards being 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 becoming more of a writer myself over the last. Um, Mm, since 2010 or so um, and so I've written two horrible novels and then I finally wrote a third one anyway sorry just, just context um, but my question is do you guys have any like different sort of axes for how you 
rate your submissions? Do you like say, I, how does it do on this category, sort of, and how does it do on this, sort of, or is it more just sort of intuitive, like, this really worked for me, the, you know, like, how do you convey that to each other, what, like, the different, because I, you know, I have a critique group, so we're critiquing each other's stuff, and like, you know, it's interesting to hear how people, how you, how you look at the stories. Pretty intuitive. Also, your shirt frocks. Um. <laughs> well, it does. I mean. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we we don't do metrics per se. It's pretty intuitive okay. and brief. <laughs> the closest we come is sometimes we'll we'll see a story that we really like, and then we'll see another story that is very similar that we really like. And sometimes in science fiction or short fiction, I should say, those kind of stories get rejected. But oftentimes we'll just say. We like them both so much, we're going to buy them, and we're just going to publish them far apart from each other. Mm. But that's that would be the only thing that we that may cause hesitation as on on some sort of list. But yeah. and, and down in the in the, the slush pile, it's, again, we don't have any kind of quantitative criteria, rubrics, or anything like that that we work through. We just you know, ask the the readers will describe why a story didn't work, did or didn't work for them, and it can be any of a thousand things, and, you know, get a second set of eyes on them and think about them. Wait, you'll ask the reader? The, 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 oh, the editor. The editor. Yeah. 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 Associate editor. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess you have, you have so many submissions that it's probably hard to do this, but, like, would it ever be possible to just be, like, let people know what level they got to or something? You. Um, yeah. Okay. There is... Just for feedback, uh, right? Which is linked to it on our website. Uh, I have a blog post that lists out, this is what our submission forms say. Each, this is where in the pipeline each one got. Oh, yeah. okay. Yes. Well, that information I think it, is on the internet. To be fair, that is a development mostly since Ben took over yeah. the particular yeah. role. Yeah. And in the long history, it has not. There's no consistent right. um, I, I, I've had at least one rejection, so I, I, I didn't get that. But. <laughs> Already changed once during. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Can I you mentioned something about podcasts as well, just for more context for anyone else who's submitting stories. So, um, with regard to the metrics and how stories are assessed, the the technical things like whether it's adverbs or like a certain degree of characterization, yeah. like any anything that you can categorize and break down into a series of parts, such that you can teach it or that you can focus on it and refine right. that particular skill. There's an, there's an intuitive look at it, and the yeah. way and someone else mentioned like how do you manage a big team at podcasts? We've got people on four continents, yeah. and what we do is we have a comment section in, on the story. So one first reader will mark it. This is worth reading, as opposed to like this is probably not ready yet. Rejection. But we have to have at least three comments on the story before it gets passed up to the co-editor. Mm. And for that, that's really the only way people get to interact on a, on a daily basis in, in our job. And mm. in those areas, this worked this work for me, this is why. And it'll be an emotional thing, it'll be an intuitive thing, it'll be, and I found this problematic because. And like, that gives us a chance to like, talk to each other, um, not only about the story, but how we approach the story. Yeah. And, and that process is helping all of us become better readers and become better writers. So if you have an opportunity to be a first reader huh. for Escape Pod, for Podcastle, for Clark's World, for Strange Horizons, any of these other short Where do I sign up? Keep an eye on Twitter. They have calls every once in a while for slush okay. readers. If you follow any one of us, we, we probably okay. retweet, retweet those calls. Okay. That's going to be really helpful. I'm going to have to. Yeah, sorry. And I'm Thank going to make you. one more comment because I think your, your question about metrics is an interesting one. On the narration side, we are much more metric oriented, not in terms of um, necessarily numbers and volumes, but in terms of vocal qualities. And one of the things we've worked really hard on recently is we're moving away from the idea of affectation. I mean, we all can do accents, but that is not an authentic voice. And we want to bring authentic voices to authentic stories. And so to help us build those pools of people that we can call upon to bring that lens of authenticity to an authentic story, we keep track of those sorts of metrics. And every once in a while, we will put out specific calls, like, I need a female Swedish speaker, or, you know, we're always growing Southeast Asian populations or non-American black populations. As we are starting to build the diversity of our stories, it is equally important to us that we are building the diversity of the voices that read those stories. 
Hi, um, so I've heard of you guys before, but the very first time I ever listened to anything was when you were nominated for the Hugos, so... Yay! Yay. Yes! <laughs> Excellent! Um, but my question was, with such an um, interesting and like passionate team, surely there have been a time when one of you was like, this story! And one of you was like, no way! Um, so, like, is there, has there been a time when you've like <coughs> passionately disagreed about whether or not something should be published? Let's, let's start with Norm, because he's got the history and he hasn't said anything in a long time. <laughs> yeah, um, interestingly, no. I mean, I'm, I don't really get particularly combative about anything, but uh, I would if there's a story that I was like, oh, that's going to bomb. Trust me, it's for your own good. But I don't know. I was editor for about four years, and nothing came up that I, that I really had an issue with as far as this assistant editors. The slush people have been so great. I mean, on a scale of one to ten, the most I've ever been like, oh, we'll give that a whirl is like five. One of the things we do when we, um, when we do recruit associate editors is we ask that they read some escape pod stories, get a sense for what we like to publish, and make sure that aligns with their own taste. So in some ways, we're kind of pre-filtering uh, for agreement. I mean, not that it's always perfectly aligned. And, you know, when I was slushing for this guy, there were things where I was like, oh, I love this story, and they didn't buy it. <laughs> <laughs> um, that doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> But it's not. But but by the same token, that's not necessarily because it wasn't a good story. A lot of pieces have to line up by the time it gets to the top, right? So there is a little bit of self-selection bias in terms of who we bring in. You know, we're looking for different viewpoints. We're looking for people with their own interesting personal narratives. But by the same token, it's a skate pod, and you ought to like a skate pod if you're going to try to help us find good stories. And I... Uh, Within the slush pile, I feel like I, that kind of like, I'm really excited about that story, like that. I'm really not. I feel like it happens all the time, inevitably, and it's a good thing. Because, you know, I, I, I pass, I say for a second read, and it's a little more than a quarter of the stories that, that my associate editors think are good. So, I'm, that means that most of the stories that they love are stories that I have to let go. Um, and, you know, Tastes are going to be different. Not every perfect story is going to get up, and there's no way around that in a thing where you have 52 weeks a year and 2,000 submissions a year. Um, and, and these kinds of disagreements are, 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 are good ways to understand each other's tastes and, and try to build a consensus and find the, the exciting things that really catch everyone and can and they're great from multiple perspectives and multiple lives. Cool, thanks. Thank you. One more thing for, for podcasts. <laughs> so, um, the other thing is, like, what do you do when you have a story that is that is good, like, objectively good story, well told, has resonance, all that kind of stuff, but some people are like, I really love this, and they were like, no. That happened uh, once when I was at Cast of Wonders, and once when I was during my podcast time. And both times where that story was really good, and the person presented arguments for why they had a problem with it, they were the one to host it because the, the contentious issues in the context around that story probably don't have enough attention. And that's one way we can kind of put stories out there that might be problematic on their own is if you can textualize them with the host spot. Then you can kind of create conversations and hopefully everybody gets to learn something. Yeah. I'm just going to give a quick technical note for those of you looking at your watches. We are scheduled to run until 11.30, but if you have 11 o'clock events that you need to go to, by all means, you will just miss cake. <laughs> Lawyer. <laughs> Just to add one one final note to, to that that particular conversation, um, I I am unusual insofar as I'm a host, which means I don't have to make any difficult editorial decisions, and people just bring me stories, and I go, "Oh, that's lovely." Here's how I understand it. Until it, that stopped happening, there was one story with Pseudopod which I loathed. And I, I, I straight up hated it. It actually made me angry. And we had a very long conversation about what we were going to do about that. Because I didn't want to run over the editorial decisions made by the incredible Pseudopod editorial team or the associate editors or anybody who'd seen something in this story that I hadn't. And we talked about whether or not it would be a good idea to have someone else pinch it for that episode. I can never remember if it's pitch it or pinch it. I'm going to go with pinch it today. Um... And ultimately what we decided to do was have me do the outro for it and talk about why that story 
made me so uncomfortable and how that was almost a, a metafictional layer of horror to it. And it was very, very difficult to do, but it remains one of the outros I'm proudest of. And just to kind of bring it back to the, the question, that conflict, when it does arise, and it doesn't arise often, is often fruitful when it does happen. Can I ask a quick question of my fellow editors? Um, I This is something we've never talked about, and that's process. It, it, I'm just thinking about the fact that you guys, the, the associate editors and Ben, will go through, they'll read the stories, they'll comment on the stories, and they send the stories up, and the way the pro, uh, software we use has all of this information on a sidebar. I realize I don't read that before I read the story. Um, before I read the story. <laughs> And I was just curious, it's like I, we've never talked about how the rest of us go about approaching the story once there's a whole bunch of commentary on it. So I was curious about what you guys do. So it's, so the, when an associate editor is reading it, there's going to be nothing over there. They're seeing the story line, they don't see the cover letter, they don't know who the submitter is. So they have nothing, nothing of, of interest to see with it. I see. Yes, these are not my um, The, uh, I see the, the cover letters and the uh, associate editor's um, comments, and usually I, what I try to do is sort of read the comments first to like know where I should be focusing my attention, and then try not to read the cover letter until afterward. Usually I fail and give into temptation and read the cover letter <laughs> first, and sometimes regret it, um, where, where, but, but that's really what I, what I try to do. Is, is getting some sense of focus, but also coming to the story fresh exactly as a reader would. That's the reason why the anonymized submissions we think are important layers, because you know, while well, we do talk about the author bios in the, in the program, you know, a lot of people may tune that out and or read the text and just skip over that and just come straight to the story. Yeah, I am. Uh... I'm with these two. I, I usually go through and send all the stories to my Kindle, at which point I'm reading it like uh, an associate editor. I don't all the information about the author is stripped. All I see is the title. I read the story. I know that the story has come up to us for final consideration, so I give it a much more careful read than when I was just reading straight through the slush pile. But I like coming at it free of, you know, other people's input because I'm, I'm obviously bringing my own biases to the table, but I'm reading it without any preconceived notions of what worked, what didn't work, the author's background. Then, like Mer said, I will go back in and read all the notes and kind of recontextualize the story based on feedback from everybody else on staff. Just before we, we dive even further into in the inside baseball stuff, because as you may be able to tell, we love this and could and will talk to you about it for hours on end. Uh, we need to bring the recording into land and, and have you people help us eat Effie's incredible cake. So I now need to briefly read a thing. And that's our show. Thanks to Laura, Setsu, Ben, Divya, Mur, Norm, Marguerite, and all the rest of you for coming on this long, strange journey with us, and also, hopefully, helping us eat this incredible cake. Massive thanks to Effie for producing it. We will be back at 4 this afternoon in 211A, just down the road from Sherlock Holmes, for, and I wrote that joke for me, for in a... <laughs> <laughs> for an escape artist's reading featuring Effie, William Ledbetter, Kate Baker, and Heather Rose Jones. Do please join us, and until then, have fun. <laughs> <laughs>